Hi, uh, this is Joe Lynch. I work with E.L. Hollingsworth, a uh, trucking and logistics company in Michigan. Uh, we deliver worldwide. I am also the owner of the website, The Logistics of Logistics. I think most of you know that. Today we have uh, Eric Moline from Carrier Direct, and he's got some great insights on the LTL industry that he's going to share with us. Uh, we're going to get started right away here, but just one little thing about housekeeping. Um, Everybody's muted in the webinar, so we don't have a lot of background noise. Uh, if you have questions, submit them in the chat feature, and I will try and ask some of the questions to Eric as we go. Uh, we're going to try and go through the slides, and I'll probably ask the you know, most appropriate question in each, each case. So without uh, further delay, we'll get uh, going with Eric Moline from Carrier Direct. Take it away, Eric. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Joe, for the introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, just to revamp a little bit of what Joe said, we're going to be exploring the changing LTL environment specifically related to the relationship between carriers and brokers as well as shippers and, and how that affects uh, staying competitive in, in this particular industry and this, I'm sorry, this part of the trucking industry. To dive right into things, uh, we're just going to do a quick introduction to Carrier Direct, give everybody an idea of what we do. We'll explore a little bit about how we got to where we are today and what today looks like and ultimately what some best practices are for strategically engaging carriers for partnership. Carrier Direct is a company that, like this page just says here, we're about bringing fresh perspectives to the transportation logistics industry. Our backgrounds are primarily not in the transportation space and because of that we're able to draw on a lot of experience from outside of this industry to help infuse some new ideas as well as uh, help the companies that we work with, and, and we work with the best companies in logistics to become better and to be better competitors and more strategically aligned. Uh, we started in the second quarter of 2011, initially just helping carriers to engage the third-party market and essentially acting as a sales and marketing company that's expanded into consulting services, uh, international logistics, and, and many other services that I'll touch on in just a moment. And at this point in time, we've exceeded about $75 million in annual managed revenue and sales. And at this point, also manage about uh, relationships of about 150 different clients. To kick things off about what we do at Carrier Direct, we have a management advisory vertical that basically is consulting where the companies you see on this page, Conway, Coyote, Pitt, Ohio, Shift Freight, and Worldwide Express are all clients of that particular vertical where we provide strategic guidance to management on any particular topics that they wish to touch on with us. Carrier Development Services is a, a part of the company that is responsible for helping less than truckload carriers or capacity providers tap into the third-party market, helping them design pricing and marketing strategies and, and ultimately just design their overall engagement strategy for how to handle and, and interact with that portion of the market. International logistics is to help third parties really build out that specific vertical and develop an entirely new service offering to their client base. Transportation analytics, because of the data and information that we have, we're able to perform quite a bit of analytic work and, and help to provide insight on where people are competitive, where they might see weaknesses and strengths in their programs, and how to become better. And the market perspective is probably one of the more well-known parts of Carrier Direct where we just provide some guidance on what we think is coming in the market, what we think the market looks like, and what we think are best practices for market participants. So we're going to jump right into exploring how we managed to get to today, and we're going to first take a look at the third-party market. As you can see very clearly, there's been a lot of consolidation that's gone on in the third-party market over the last year, couple years even, where what that really represents is the, the consolidation of buying power, the the aggregation of resources across more than one company, um, which on the one hand is going to be helpful for economies of scale and being able to better tap into technology with these companies, but more importantly means that they'll have a little bit more leverage and negotiating power when it comes to engaging the third-party market. And the reason that's the case ultimately is just there's mounting barriers to entry for many of their peers. Guys that are smaller, it's very difficult to break into the truckload market and especially the less than truckload market because carriers are very cognizant of who they're willing to work with at this point in time, especially if a company does not fit within their scope of strategic alliances or, or doesn't really hit their criteria of, of companies that they're interested in in 
opening a relationship with or continuing a relationship with. Um, and we'll also discuss those a little bit later in this presentation about what those criteria are and, and really how to position a uh, third party or a shipper for that matter as a as an ideal partner for carriers with the, the guys with the assets or even the asset light carriers. Uh, Joe, are there Eric, any questions regarding this slide? Yeah, Eric, you mentioned um, some of the carriers are kind of going to question, especially in the LTL market, but also in the truckload market, who they work with going forward. Um, now, most LTL isn't done through load boards, but there are still kind of those relationships that are, you know, the onesie twosies are, uh, what, what do you see happening there? Um, I, I would assume just a consolidation even further in that sense. Uh, you, you can see consolidation in a, a lot of different ways in the marketplace outside of even just M&A. Uh, it's going to come from you know pricing agreements being more favorable with any one particular company, steering freight in that direction. It's going to come from just alliances and, and people using one another for capacity solutions as they work on developing their own best-in-class solution. So in terms of just the, the onesie twosies, there, there's quite a bit of that freight in the market, but it's not it's not consolidated because it's across so many different shippers and so many different regions and lanes. It, it's likely to get spread about uh, according to the various trends that we're already seeing in place, and, and I think we'll just be a byproduct of what we see on a much larger scale. Okay, sounds good. This next slide is is really to highlight that. Third parties represent a, a pretty unique opportunity to carriers. Not only, as you can see, the freight that they're giving carriers is generally pretty decent freight, um, but they also represent a growing portion of the market. More and more shippers are going through third parties for various reasons, whether it's technology, whether it's access to capacity, especially as capacity is tightening, whether it's just simple customer service or access to more than one service offering rather than just LTL or just truckload, but international warehousing and, and loads of other opportunities for services available. I mean, what this really represents is, is, again, carriers have a very unique opportunity with third parties. There is a very legitimate value proposition that third parties can offer to carriers. Oftentimes, it's too expensive for a carrier to send a sales rep into a shipper that doesn't move more than five LTL shipments a week. They have to pay for the sales rep's card. They have a cell phone. They have travel expenses. They have entertainment expenses on top of their salary and benefits. I think it would be very expensive if it's not a, a shipper that moves a substantial amount of freight. And oftentimes, it wouldn't make sense for a carrier to send them in because, again, it's just simply too expensive. And so what that means is third parties can act as a way for carriers to tap into those smaller shippers where there is still good freight. It can still be profitable as long as it's managed correctly and it doesn't cost the carrier anything to go in there outside of, you know, maybe having a slightly less aggressive rate than they might give otherwise uh, the retail market. Um, and, and really what that means is, again, that carriers can use third parties as a wholesale distribution channel. And we'll tap onto that uh, just shortly. But before I move on, were there, were there any questions relating to this slide in particular, Joe? Yeah. yeah. Could you explain a little bit about what it's uh, this, um, it says 10 outbound inbound states and this, the relevance that, to the rest of uh, this slide? Yeah, that's that's in relation specifically to volume that's moving in those states. So obviously, California is the largest outbound volume, or, I'm sorry, outbound lane by volume and Texas is the largest inbound lane by volume. And really what that just highlights is, is a lot of things people already knew, um, and in certain circumstances what people may not have known, that Michigan is a massive outbound market for the entire nation. Uh, if you look, there doesn't seem to be a lot of consistency in that there's states on the West Coast, there's states on the East Coast, and there's states in the middle of the country that are moving freight, as well as in the Southeast where you see Georgia. And so, again, what that what that represents is there's there's quite a bit of freight moving in a lot of different lanes, and 3PLs allow carriers access to a very diverse set of opportunities that so long as priced intelligently and with specific intentions and, and a very designed strategy that this is all freight that can A, uh, be tendered to carriers, but they can they can also make sure to focus in and laser into the the freight that's more profitable for them, the freight that they need. 
uh, where they're they're going to be able to either a operate as a whole a little bit better, or maybe it alleviates some pain points and and some imbalances in their network so that they're not moving empties or trailers with less than fifteen thousand pounds on them on their line haul. Sounds good. Moving on to this next slide, what you can see is that across the top ten carriers, they represent in the LTL world at least just south of seventy percent of the market. Uh, it, very clearly is a highly consolidated, very dense uh, market share among each one of these carriers. And especially with YRC, where you could pull in Holland, Redway, and New Penn, and the regional carriers there, I think that, that that stands to say that this isn't the truckload market where it's, it's very spot market driven, where it's, it's very, I wouldn't necessarily say easy, but it's easier to, to find capacity. Whereas LTL, it's a relationship game. It's a strategy game. And you don't have the opportunity to work with a lot of carriers unless you can develop that relationship because they understand that when a lot of times pricing is stagnant for a year that they're opening themselves up to quite a bit of risk. Now, I imagine we'll be seeing that change pretty quickly here in the marketplace. But, again, the point of this slide is to really highlight how consolidated the market is across the top 10 carriers in LTL, whereas if you look at the truckload market, that's definitely not the case. It's substantially more fragmented. And then what that also is is – indicating for the brokers that, that are participating in this webinar that are tuned into this is that you have to be very, very cognizant of, of what it's going to take to build a strong platform that you can offer to your customers. Very infrequently do you find any broker that's been able to build a substantial reselling model on a handful of regional or super regional carriers that offer them outstanding pricing. Almost always do they need to have a cornerstone carrier like an ABF, like a YRC, that they have a really strong relationship with. Um, and frequently, they even need more than one cornerstone carrier that really offers uh, you know, a standard service and then maybe a premium service and sometimes an economy service even. But again, this is all so, this Eric, information could you touch, that is... Eric, sure. could you touch Sorry. on that? You, you started to mention that there's some premium services versus um, other services. Could you explain what that means and how it relates to these 10? Definitely. Um, it, it, premium really just means their their place in the market in terms of transit time, in terms of service capabilities, in terms of technology. Um, when you look at premium, the top two names I think are, are outstanding examples of premium carriers, both FedEx Freight and Conway Freight, which is really the quintessential car premium carrier. Excuse me. I think YRC and, and UPS Freight would be a, a great standard carrier, and a good example of a, an economy carrier would be a Roadrunner or a Central Transport. Now, I'll touch on this in just a little bit um, later in the slide about carrier education, but really there's there's nothing that's bad, uh, good, wrong, or right about any one of those buckets because in order to build a successful reselling platform, you need every single one of those buckets, and you need to have a, a strong partner in uh, economy and standard and as a, a premium solution. And so, again, what what this slide really goes to show is that it's just it's a very consolidated market and, and people have to be very cognizant of how they're developing their strategy in engaging the LTL world. Okay, one other question I had, Eric, was back on the other slide, is are you, um, are, are all these carriers willing to work with 3PLs right now? Are they all, where are they all at that way? I wouldn't say necessarily all of them. Um, I know, for example, FedEx has a very specific and, and clear internal set of criteria that's important to them, that if a 3PL isn't able to satisfy those requirements, that they wouldn't be willing to start a relationship. On the other hand, you see companies like Old Dominion that you know, are very controlled about the pricing they give out, and Conway Freight would also follow that line as well as Estes. ABF, on the other hand, are, is not interested in, this, in establishing a relationship generally unless you can bring them account-specific business first. Whereas R&L carriers, for the most part, is generally turned off. Unless you have a, a strong relationship with them already and tender them quite a bit of freight, they're they're generally not interested in, in opening up the relationship or expanding on in, on what they've already done. So the answer really to that question is yes and no. There are carriers that are interested. It is definitely possible to get a relationship going. Uh, but in many circumstances, there are carriers that aren't. And nonetheless, it will be very difficult at the end of the day to build a, a strong LTL program, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done. Again, given the right strategy, leadership, and um, 
and I would say resources. Well, I think it makes it even more significant that you need to build a relationship with these top 10, knowing that some aren't necessarily open to it, and you need one of these cornerstone um, carriers to be able to service the nationwide, especially North America-wide, I guess. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and, and really, it, it couldn't be described any better to say that the LTL relationship management game is just like dating. Um, it, ultimately, if, if you're interested in a carrier, the last thing you should do is walk up to them and say, hey, what does it take to get rates with you guys? Because I can, I can almost promise you that they will be instantly turned off. Because at that point, they realize that it's strictly a transactional relationship. There's no strategy to it, even though it may be transactional in nature in terms of the freight that, that any 3PL might tender them. So I couldn't agree with that more. It, it, it is definitely a, a game. Uh, it's definitely a very, very hands-on and very attention-heavy uh, industry and, and relationship management um, part of the industry where, again, you have to be very cognizant of, of the way that you're approaching the market. And one, one last thing before we leave this slide, Eric, you said something to me offline before about um, um, nurturing and taking care of your LTL partners is more important than taking care of your, or just as important as taking care of your clients. It, that's entirely true, Joe. Uh, the the best brokers see their carriers as customers, along with their shippers as customers, because they understand that as a broker, they're a they're a line that connects two dots. They're a, a channel for those carriers, and they have to understand the value that they'll bring to them in order to be able to continue to resell their services. And I mentioned at one point in time, and I've, I've said this before, that the, the best 3PLs are the 3PLs that are willing to fire a customer. And the reason I say that is because if, if a customer is damaging a relationship with a carrier, that relationship is, is probably substantially more valuable than the relationship with that customer. That's not going to be the case in every circumstance, but that is to say that if, if you have a, a 3PL that's willing to say, you know, you're, this just really isn't working out for us, um, we think you should find another service provider. If anything, that shipper more so than the carrier should really tune into that and say, okay, we'll I actually need to, to work on de developing a better relationship with this 3PL because I know that they're going to have some strong carrier relationships and they'll be around for quite a while. Excellent. Moving on to this next slide, one of the things that, that we're seeing now that, that freight levels are, are coming back um, is, is that there's some new challenges that are in front of us. But more importantly, what it is is to look back and see how we managed to get to the place that we are. There's, there's a very general and consistent sentiment among carriers that brokers are the reason that they're unprofitable. And, and I would really argue against that, not because brokers didn't add fuel to the fire. I think ultimately the way that brokers work, the way that the reselling market works is just by virtue of how they operate. Um, they're going to magnify and, and really hone in on the cracks in any one carrier's pricing agreement. And the reason that is is because when you have a, a, a technology transportation system that allows you to rate multiple carriers at once, whether the sales rep on the broker's floor or the shipper is picking the carrier, when a carrier is substantially underpricing the market and doesn't realize that they're doing it, they're going to be selected in that circumstance. And again, that's nothing that's really at the broker's fault. So much is just the way that the industry is changing allows, I wouldn't necessarily even say allows as much as really highlights inconsistencies and and again, cracks in any one carrier's pricing agreement. And the reason that that is, is in 2009, you know, when, when we really started to see the substantial drop in tonnage from the Great Recession, people needed freight, carriers needed freight. And so rather than sort of going about a very strategic and specific way of tapping into the market and, and doing it in a very intelligent manner, they gave out a lot of wild pricing agreements that some of them might still even be in play today um, that are just simply overly competitive and they're driving the carriers to substantial levels of unprofitability. And again, the reason isn't because brokers were the cause of that. It's just that brokers were the opportunity. Brokers had a technology platform that offered something to shippers that carriers didn't have prior to when the, the broker market really started taking off. 
And the reason that that's important, again, is, is they didn't so much as forcibly lower profitability levers for carriers. In fact, I don't think that that was their goal at all. And I think many carriers would either say that it was, and I think many brokers would say that that wasn't something they intended to do ever. But I think that there is definite value when you look at the way that the market operates and understanding, well, this is something that's just a virtue of, of how this industry works. Uh, just again, because of the way that the broker market engages shippers and shippers engage brokers and carriers engage brokers and brokers engage shippers, it's going to happen. Uh, the carriers operating ratios would would go to a pretty unfavorable place because, again, of, of just the way that the entire industry works. And what that really highlights now is the new challenges we have, especially carriers, are now that we're not starving for freight, how do we determine what's good freight, what's bad freight? More importantly, how do we determine what strategic freight and what freight can we stand to lose in the future? And they're trying to figure out and balance those needs that they have because without that strategic relationship, when 2009 happens, because at some point tonnage will drop again, when 2009 happens again, it's going to be just as painful the second time around if they're not adequately prepared for it. Uh, Eric, I have an observation. Really- I have an observation sure. regar- regarding this. Is you know, I think carriers might have had um, pricing strategies that w- I, I know they did that would say, I, I really want freight in this one geographic area. These lanes are really attractive to me, so they put some very good pricing in place, and then. And I think they have other places where they say, well, we'll get some of this business also in a little higher margin for us. And that might have made sense when they gave that to a shipper. In the new era with the TMS, when you give that to a 3PL, the only lanes you get are the ones you price very aggressively. So then uh, your operating ratios come back and you find out you didn't win any of the higher margin business that you'd planned on winning. So basically, carrier pricing strategy had to change completely to get the operating ratios they, they they would like to to survive with, and I think that's what's changed in the last uh, number of years. As you start hearing from the carrier saying, "We can't we can't continue doing business at a poor operating ratio," so, so I think it's forced the three PLs to go back and say, "We we have to adjust our our margins accordingly too, to make sure that that carrier that we're partnering with is getting the right the right operating ratio on every client." You're very right, Joe, and I really couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think specifically relating to a lot of that, too, and that's something I'll touch on in just a bit, but there's no way that for an entire year, which is usually what price agreements stay uh, stay in place for, that that, those lanes would be favorable then anyways. Uh, There was a point in time when you would see pricing agreements from, from yellow or wire, I'm sorry, from yellow or roadway that would be one discount for the entire nation, and just when when you think about that, there's no way that that would work. Uh, there's no way that that's something that would would pan out very favorably for any carrier. Right. We have another question. We have one other question sure. related to what is the technology enabled carriers? Could you describe that in more detail? I think you're doing that later in the presentation. Yeah, and and that that'll be something actually that will be helpful to to touch on a little bit after this. But I, I think one of the things that will be important is is again just like with brokers. Those with the best technology and the most forward-thinking mindsets will really be the ones that triumph in this industry. It will be easier to touch on that a little bit after we cover some additional material, but that's definitely something that we'll see. This, the second point here is, is we're also seeing some spillover from the truckload market. As capacity tightens, especially on Fridays, you find a lot of shippers breaking shipments up into LTL-sized shipments rather than truckloads. Uh, and that's something that the less than truckload markets um, – going to have to cope with. It's, it's likely going to increase the average weight of the shipment, and, and they're going to have to find a way to manage that within their own networks. And what that also highlights is being able to respond on a demand basis will be important moving forward, which is something I'll also touch on soon. Um, and then lastly, again, that technology-enabled carriers, and this includes brokers as well, those will be the the winners in this industry, uh, the people that understand the needs before they really become big needs or become they become standards. Uh, kind of like when cars started getting seatbelts, the cars that had seatbelts before they really started to be regulated by law were the ones that you know saw higher profits because they were able to sell a, a more premium solution, a better solution to their customers that wasn't industry standard just yet. To, to touch on, on, again, the technology-enabled carriers, 
specifically relating to carriers pricing themselves, that's going to be a, a really big piece of what carriers, what regions, what alliances are able to develop profitability first. Um, in terms of web services and really being able to use live data connections to move freight and to price things, that's going to be a major a major strategic initiative moving forward for anybody that wants to develop a, a profitable enterprise. First, in relation to dimensional pricing, the, the example I always like to use, Joe, is a, a created engine is class 70, an uncreated engine is class 85, but if you wrap cardboard with saran wrap around a, an engine, it all of a sudden is considered created, which doesn't make any sense. But for some reason, that can represent a, a, 15, a 5 to 15 percent loss in revenue for a carrier, depending on the lane and other, other information about that particular shipment. And really what we need to consider is what does the actual cost from that piece of freight represent to a carrier? Does it take up any other space? Can you stack it on something? Can you not stack anything on top of it? Is it not is it simply too heavy for the space that it's taking up? Um, because at the end of the day, if you think about class 500 pound of feathers compared to the same shipment, same weight, class you know 50 of, of bricks, um, the bricks again they're more dense, but and, and they take up less space. But it's very infrequent that they'll they'll be the exact same weight, especially if you were to have a, an equally rated shipment um, for both feathers and bricks. And, and that's again that's to highlight that there's there's Many scenarios where it doesn't quite make sense the way the pricing is built now. A, yeah, a really I, 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 would, I would also argue that when you have that that kind of thing, it, it gives uh, it, it lends itself to a lot of distrust in the market. Not only the three PLs, but the carriers. When you you present to the marketplace the shippers something that you know I, I could ship this at class 65, and I thought I was right, and now I'm being called 85, and I have no way to recover that from my customer. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't breed the kind of trust that the market wants. Exactly. Nobody really cares that much if, uh, if somebody is shipping bolts that are threaded for automotive use or if they're not threaded at all and are just going to basically just raw materials going to the next manufacturer. Um, that shouldn't affect pricing at all, but for some reason the, the NMFC code takes little nuances like that into the case. Um, Eric, we had one other question related to this. Um, what percent of freight do you see in going dimensional here versus dynamic? Well, so I don't think that that's necessarily something that's going to be exclusive of one another. I think that you can have dimensional pricing and dynamic pricing. Right, but what per, what percent of the market do you think will start seeing that? Are there anybody playing this, doing this right now? I think Central Transport's doing dimensional, aren't they? UPS has started to roll it out. I expect that we'll see it from FedEx also very soon, just by virtue of, of the way that they price a lot of their parcel business. Uh, that is to say, at one point in time, people sort of thought of dimensional pricing and dynamic pricing and, and ultimately just the ability to send data in a, a real-time situation as a bit of a far-fetched thought, something that wasn't going to be coming into the LTL space. And, and I can tell you just from conversations that I have, there's carriers today that are working on strategies on how to design something like this. There's carriers today that are, are working on developing the technology to understand what their costs are on a very micro basis, uh, whether it's you know hour by hour, day by day, minute by minute. Um, and the same goes for dimensional pricing. You know, if, if somebody ships a pallet of lead bricks, uh, and, and, you know, ultimately it, it, that particular pallet weighs 17,000 pounds and so there's not a lot of other freight you can put on that trailer. Well, then you should pay for that 17,000 pounds and not so much of just the fact that it's probably class 50 and, um, you know, and, and uh, otherwise a heavy shipment, but otherwise small. And what that is to highlight, Joe, is, is that carriers are getting more intelligent. They're becoming They're becoming more cognizant of the costs that are associated with with running assets and owning assets, uh, and especially in the in the case of you know lanes where there's there's quite a bit of freight moving and and the need for capacity is very high. That is to say, too, though, it, like the example I used earlier with a truckload market freight spilling over into the LTL market, dynamic pricing is going to become very real. It doesn't make sense that pricing is the same on July 
1st as it is on January 4th. There's substantially more demand for capacity uh, during the summer months than there is during the winter months, especially after the holidays. And so what we're seeing in a lot of these cases is carriers are saying, well, why do I need to keep pricing stagnant for a year? In fact, very few carriers will have in, I would actually I would go so far as to say no carrier will have the exact same looking network in 12 months from today. There's just simply no way that that can happen with the amount of attrition and friction that you have between you know finding new shippers, finding shippers that are you know going to be stolen by other carriers or even 3PLs. There's just no way that any one carrier's network will will stay the same. And so working to balance that by 3PL freight and by shipper freight will will be incredibly important moving forward to making sure you're allocating assets and, and routing assets intelligently. Yeah, it's interesting. You could almost look at it as the, as the stock market or a commodity market. Um, it, it is changing, and um, the market pays what the market needs to pay. And I think the technology we have obviously uh, accommodates that, where pr- prior to computerization, we would have never been able to manage that correctly. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more, and especially with deregulation, with with a lot of carriers now being able to set their own prices and understanding what their value add is. To say that things should be priced correctly is that's really only the tip of the iceberg, Joel. And and I think that we're going to see a, a lot of carriers moving towards dynamic pricing in the future. In fact, it, it would surprise me if if people didn't start saying, okay, well, my truck's going to be in. Chicago for the next three hours. Let's see if we can find some other freight in Chicago. So let's drop prices there for, you know, the next three hours by 10%. And that's something that is going to become an even more enabled with real-time information gathering is as drivers are able to share more information. Let's say that they thought that they were getting a six pallet order and turns out that it's really an eight and they have less space available on that trailer. Well, that's going to be information that it's going to be necessary for dispatch to have in routing trailers correctly. Um, and not only that, but also just real-time information gathering. I'd also add sharing to that, and, and that transparency between brokers, shippers, and carriers is going to be extremely important moving forward in, in A, helping to design intelligent pricing programs, but B, developing a best-in-class solution because no broker can have a best-in-class solution without partner carriers. And for many shippers in the market, for all the shippers that move through 3PLs, it's difficult for carriers to have a best-in-class solution without a strong broker partnership. And so real-time information gathering, dynamic pricing, dimensional pricing, these things are all very real. We're on the cusp of them now, and and they're actively conversations that we're being asked to participate in just because they're they're coming to light very quickly. People are understanding that they no longer have their costs accurately represented, and rather than closing their eyes, spinning around three times and throwing a dart at the dartboard, they'd rather have a laser sight to be able to zone in on what profitability would really mean for carriers moving forward. Excellent. The last portion of this presentation, we really want to touch on what is what is a, a good partnership? What is a good engagement strategy going to look like moving forward? One of the things that, that carriers will definitely see an opportunity for working with brokers for, but more importantly, brokers arguably put an over amount of emphasis on, is the way that carriers will use broker volume to complement their already moving freight networks. Uh, the way that the way that carriers will be able to offset imbalances and, and create better utilization of their assets and ultimately more profit through brokers is definitely a strategic initiative, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's the only and arguably may not always be the most important, Joe. I think yep. that one thing that we'll see moving forward is is a, a really a focus on what else is important to, to the carrier community uh, outside of just, you know, helping to, to fill some trucks and some backhaul lanes. Excellent. I think one of the things that we'll see moving forward is carriers starting to see 3PL as a distribution channel. To use another industry in this example, it doesn't really make sense that this particular industry operates the way that it does, considering you see the alcoholic beverage market use distributors all the time. There's wine distributors. You look at AB InBev, for example, the manufacturers of Anheuser-Busch, there's there's distributors that they work with, and when they have a a sales representative that manages 
certain strategic accounts for them, they're almost always huge accounts. They're hotels that sell a lot of beer or they're, uh, you know, big chains of restaurants like Let Us Entertain You that, that sell a lot of Bud Light. They're not small mom and pop restaurants because, again, it's too expensive to send someone in there with all the benefits and compensation that they would receive. So looking to 3PLs to really fill that niche for carriers is, is very important. There's a lot of carriers that for a long while now have understood at what point should we you know, decide that it's not ideal accounts for us to approach if, if they don't move X amount of freight. There's, there's a lot of carriers that have been saying that for years now, Joe. And I don't think that this is necessarily going to apply to the entire third-party market because obviously companies like Menlo wouldn't fall into this. They manage, they manage massive companies like General Motors. But for the transactional brokers in the marketplace, um, you know, I, I think of a, an Echo or a Freight Quote, a Blue Grace Worldwide Express, those guys, this definitely is something that would apply to them where carriers are going to see them as a, a chance to get into accounts uh, and shippers that previously they wouldn't have ever had the opportunity to get into, um, again, because of the costing model that they have. So we have a question here um, related to that. Do you see as they be, they, they have value-added resellers like the ones you described, do you see also a time coming when when the carriers won't work with smaller smaller players and those smaller players buy from the value added resellers made more or less the authorized or approved three PLs, I should say. That's definitely something that we see going on in the marketplace a lot. In fact, if, if someone's trying to break into LTL, it's very difficult to, very difficult to start a relationship with any carrier without some volume moving. And, and it's kind of the chicken or the egg. Well, I can't get freight if I don't have the pricing. I can't get pricing if I don't have the freight. So how do I shortcut the road a little bit? And when I say shortcut, it's not so much as that they're trying to circumvent anyone, nearly as much as they're, they're trying to create the opportunity for themselves to, to really tap into the, the opportunities that there are. That said, I, there's definitely mounting barriers to entry in the broker market, and, and there's very few LTL brokers that are new compared to truckload brokers. And there's few truckload brokers that are continuously new and entering the market on their own. That said, again, I, I think that there will without a doubt be people that will tap into the, in a way, authorized pool of brokers to get access to that capacity. Some carriers will be okay with that. Uh, many carriers won't be. Um, but ultimately, it, as, long as, as long as things are carried out in a, in a manner that's responsible, that's intelligent, it ultimately doesn't pose the biggest threat to, to carriers. Carriers really don't like the idea of double brokering, and I would agree with that. I think that, you know, if, honestly, if I own my own assets, I wouldn't like the idea of it either. But there is a broker out there who has customers that only will move freight through that particular broker, and they won't be able to get rates or access to capacity through those carriers. And so it's, just, it's a way, really, of, of tapping into the market. It's a relatively small part of the market, so I don't think it really warrants putting a lot of attention towards, but... Again, it, it's definitely happening. It happens. It will happen. It will happen more uh, in the future. But I think that it's it's a very controlled portion. So one uh, one other question. So Menlo is owned by Conway, or same same parent company. Um, do you Correct. see other three PLs and uh, carriers becoming um, partners, joint venture partners, or maybe even um, a carrier buying a three PL or vice versa? I think that I think that there's a, a definite opportunity for us to see the biggest carriers in the market becoming the biggest brokers as well. Um, as you see a lot of the benefit that that comes from working with brokers, there's also a lot of benefit that comes from owning a broker from the same extent. Um, you know, I know Conway Multimodal is the brokerage owned by Conway Inc. and obviously they're a sister company to Conway Freight. Well, coordinating the two sales channels there provides substantial benefit to or would yield substantial benefit to Conway Inc. and Conway Multimodal and Conway Freight individually. And same would go for Conway Truckload and Conway Multimodal. Um, you also look at a lot of the, the truckload brokers, I'm sorry, the truckload carriers. J.B. Hunt is developing a, an asset light division. Schneider is, uh, Roadrunner obviously is, is expanding quite a bit in terms of their service offerings and, and their ability to 
you know, offer customers a number of now, different things. Ro- Roadrunner is already asset like, but they they have assets or not? It, Roadrunner does have assets, and they've been okay. expanding on both on both sides in both directions. Okay. Um, where they're you know they're acquiring brokers and they're acquiring carriers as well, truckload carriers, and um, you know really tapping into more capacity just by uh, just by purchasing companies. Sounds good. Moving on to this next slide, what I think that this highlights and is extremely important moving forward to realize is transparency is absolutely paramount for brokers and carriers to interact in a way that is is a relationship that's sustainable. It's it's going to be very difficult to develop strong, intelligent, strategic pricing programs for 3PLs um, in correlation with carriers to approach shippers with or to propose to shippers. Uh, and again, that said, shippers also represent a lot of the transparency that has to go on here. It's it's very difficult and it's it, it's very challenging for a carrier to work with a broker, especially on a blanket or generic pricing program, where they don't know why or why not. Uh, you know, freight is tendered to them in in certain lanes or or certain freight profiles that they're really targeting. That said, I, I wouldn't so much as suggest you know sharing competitive information between carrier of you know. Hey, AAA Cooper, this is the discount that Southeastern Freight Lines is giving me. And in fact, I would discourage that. That will that will burn bridges for you. But giving giving carriers guidance as to what they can expect and being real about it and managing expectations is is very important. I am a, a huge proponent of the idea that if you manage expectations correctly, you can conquer the world. And there's been a couple of instances in history when that's nearly happened. But to say to a carrier, we don't we don't know how much freight we can truly expect your pricing is competitive but ultimately it's it's not competitive enough where i'm expecting us to see a lot of freight the reason is, is you just don't have the name brand of the carriers you're competing with in this lane um it and our, our sales force just simply isn't used to seeing your name in our tms yet we're working hard on providing carrier education to our sales force so that they understand when to use you but again I, I don't want to yet make any promises and so if you want to just put the current pricing proposal into play and run with it for 30, 60, 90 days to see what happens. I'm more than comfortable to do that. Being very open and and friendly in dialogue and and open to discussion with carriers is going to be a major strategic point for brokers moving forward. The more transparent they are with carriers, the more likely that they're able to develop a strong relationship, the more likely they're to be able to alleviate any problems that they have. Eric, some of uh, the print is a little small on there. Could you, um, you don't have to read e- each word there, but could you exp- talk about some of the tasks on here that are, are um, points that are collaborative, then some that are strategic, then a few that are tactical, just just so we uh, sure. have, uh, understand the differences? Without a doubt. And, and I think what, what would be helpful is, is we'll start with just tactical uh, and really highlighting what oh, that by is. The way, we're, is. By the way, we're sending out this... Um, deck when we're done so you can see it in closer detail exactly uh, so tactical is um a tactical is a part of the relationship where it's going to be very very take and not very give based it's going to be just cost uh, you know I, hey i need a carrier in the northeast can can you help me out you know will, will you be that capacity provider for me um you aren't very clear. You're not very transparent. It's it's very just cost driven, uh, and a lot of times service driven, which means that people may not understand the value add that that a relationship provides to either side very well. Strategic, you're looking into integrating technology. You're looking at, uh, you know, providing information to one another where it helps to make more intelligent decisions. Although it's still somewhat limited information, you know, you consider things like long term needs. Uh, unique offerings or, you know, technology improvements that would be better for one another. But again, it's not something where you truly are working together just yet. Whereas when you go all the way to collaborative, you're looking at OR, you're contemplating, okay, this is where I need to be. Collaborative is where the best carrier relationships exist, and it doesn't necessarily have to be on a managed supply chain basis. Um, 
some of the most intelligent carriers and intelligent 3PLs have had conversations along the lines of, you know, we really value you as a client. We find that, you know, your your sales force and your operations personnel is, is always treating us with respect, and we really value the relationship. At this point, the way that pricing is structured, we simply can't continue to operate because it's so poor that it were extraordinarily unprofitable. That said, rather than just canceling the pricing agreement, we would like to propose something new where we can operate profitably. We realize we're going to see a, a drop in freight volume, but again, we want to continue the relationship, and we don't want to become uh, we, we don't want to lose that strategic partnership or collaborative partnership that we have, but we have to adjust pricing. Those are the relationships where you see, Joe, the, the benefit coming from both sides, and it, it's substantial. It's, uh, it's very powerful, and, and it, again, it leads to a sustainable long-term relationship that many other 3PLs and carriers won't be able to say that they have, and it will be a detriment to them. It will be a competitive disadvantage. Eric, as I mentioned to you offline, um, through my uh, website and my blog, I've noticed that um, the people uh, who read it are often very interested in the top 25 LTL carriers and anything related to negotiation. And I think that's it's while it is worthwhile information, I think really um, it's it's looking for that silver bullet where, hey, I, I found a new carrier who's going to give me cheap pricing. And it's probably wrong-headed, you know, to, to say, I, great, I found a new carrier and I can to, to use and abuse, really has to move more towards this as, hey, I, I have, I know who the big players are. I know who the small players are. I'm going to work with them in a, a way that recognizes that it's not about a negotiation. It's not about the lowest rate. It's about, let's make sure we have win-win relationships. And we'll, I'll say win-win-win, the shipper, the, the, the 3PL, and the carrier. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. And when I have conversations with 3PLs about capacity and, and how they're managing it, the most intelligent 3PLs will take the resources, invest the time in understanding what a capacity option really offers to their customer base and to their, their current network, their current portfolio. Um, just as much as it would be unwise for a very young, small broker to sign on every single carrier in the world because there's no way you'll be able to tender a decent amount of freight to anyone. That said, you have to kind of balance the ability to tap into lower cost savings, uh, which would yield a better margin and, and arguably be able to bring more freight, and just building the relationship. I, I, I have seen in many circumstances carriers will very much respect a broker that says, I'm really interested in working with you. I want to get something going, but this just isn't the time and place. And ultimately, I'm concerned that if we start something now, we will – go down a path that will later damage the relationship and make it irreparable and we'll never be able to work together. So for the time being, let's hold off on this, not table it, but let's just postpone you know, putting this into play and, and let's find a, a time and a place when it really makes sense for both I think, brands. I think a woman said that to me once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, it's funny because, again, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stress enough that, that the, the carrier management game is very much like dating. Uh, the worst thing that any one broker can do is walk up to a carrier and say, hey, what do we need to do to get raised with you guys? Because I can promise you that even if you do get raised, they're very, very, very uncompetitive. Uh, and, and that's if you are able to even get into the, the bucket of you know, brokers that they trust and, and will let into their world. So it's very much like a relationship. It has to be very, very specifically designed, and it has to be very, very nurtured. Uh, and you have to spend time making sure that all of your carriers are happy and are getting the the freight that they need, the freight that they want, and the attention that they need, and vice versa on the 3PL side. 3PLs require attention from the carrier side, and, and, and it has to be, again, in order for it to be collaborative and, and ultimately a competitive advantage, it has to be a very open dialogue. Moving on to the... The, the last slide with content, at least on it, uh, there's essentially five different things that I think are, are the most important for carriers moving forward uh, and, and, and also just establishing that relationship and, and understanding uh, what is, is a value that you can bring to a carrier relationship from the third party side or shipper side. Um, that's not to say that the thing that you don't see on here, obviously, is size. For one, that's because everybody knows that size does matter. Um, 
But aside from that, more importantly, that's not always necessarily number one. Um, even if you're a huge company, if you can't manage your payables or if you tell an LTL carrier that we only pay on receipt of a POD, I can promise you that at some point in time you're likely to get a GRI that others won't get, or at least won't get nearly as large of a GRI as you will. The reason is, again, because they understand the financial implications of working with you and that you take that much longer to pay, and so they either want less freight with you or they want to compensate themselves better in terms of what they're going to experience financially. Uh, the same would go for technology, in that if, if you're not able to manage a carrier's pricing correctly and, and really allow them to represent their costs in an intelligent way, if your technology doesn't support that, then it's going to, to again, it's going to hurt your relationship with those carriers. Uh, the carriers appreciate the opportunities that they have, the the relationships that they have where they can say, I understand that this pricing is a little bit more competitive, uh, but because of the way that we built it, it's also a little bit more complicated. In fact, it's a lot more complicated than what we've seen on the market. Is this something that you can handle? And the brokers that can handle the pricing that's more complicated will always get better pricing because the brokers that can't handle pricing that's more complicated will get something that's somewhat of a wash because carriers have to protect themselves against a lot of different scenarios. They're going to, in a way, water down their pricing so that it's less competitive, so they're less exposed to that risk. The next thing I think that is extremely important is building a powerful culture. It's, it's mind-blowing how few brokers are cognizant of the way they approach carriers, the way that their employees approach carriers, and talk to customer service personnel at terminals or customer service personnel at HQ, whether that, you know, whichever one it is, or the way that they talk to their dispatchers. Um, carriers are very cognizant of what 3PLs are rude on the phone and what ones are not able to control their agents or their employees. And they very, very much appreciate when third parties call in and they're understanding of the operations, their understanding of the predicament that a carrier might be in and, and why the third party is in that predicament as well. They're polite. They're cooperative. That's not to say that, that they won't necessarily make requests. That's not to say that they won't uphold a carrier to commitments that they make. But that is to say that in order to, in order to truly be a good partner, you have to be understanding, polite, and cooperative. And, and for a lot of brokers who haven't spent – very much time, if any at all, on an LTL doc, seeing the operations and, and seeing what actually happens when they move freight and, and really understanding how a trailer is loaded and how trailers are built and when to cut a trailer and how to decide what freight needs to go on which trailer because of guarantees or service requirements and so forth and so on. When a lot of 3PLs don't have personnel that have done that, it makes it difficult. So promoting a culture that says – we respect the carriers and we see the carriers just as much of a customer as ours as we do our shippers. That's important. And, and those are the, the brokers that you see that grow the fastest, whether it's the truckload side or the LTL side. I, I, can't, I really can't stress this enough that this is otherwise generally overlooked by a lot of brokers, but it is, it is extremely important. Eric, during this, Eric, during this last uh, winter, which was uh, particularly bad here in the Midwest, uh, as you know, um, I, I saw a lot of, um, impatience from not only from the shippers, but also in the 3PL. And, you know, what I always would say is you're on, you drove on the highway here. How would you like to see a whole bunch of trucks in that seven inches of snow? And it, it, it kind of defied logic that, that the whole Midwest seemed to shut down on certain days, yet all the freight was to deliver without, um, without delay. And, and I think also worth noting is trying to understand that the carriers would all say, when we lose one day due to weather, it takes us a few weeks to catch up. And boy, it's hard to explain that to some shippers. And I imagine it's very difficult to explain to some 3PLs, but it's it's the truth. <laughs> it's very true. In fact, it's mind-blowing to me, Joe, how how the entire market responded to the winter. Uh, there's There's carriers, especially in the Midwest, that you know they may not necessarily have the financial resources to I'm sorry financial resources to invest in new assets continuously and and refresh old assets and it's it's very difficult a lot of times to get a, a tractor to even start and get the engine to turn over in the winter like we saw this past winter 
Um, well, yeah, also, yeah. Eric, relate, close related to that was a lot of the carriers here, uh, again, in Michigan, mid Midwest, um, started getting affected by hours of service. Their drivers were on the road a lot more, going much slower. So by Friday at noon, all their drivers were done. And, that, and you can't very well hire new drivers for a half a day, but um, that was where they were at. And they, and they explained it to 3PL, boy, some shippers don't want to hear that you don't have drivers. Um, yeah, it's it's basic human understanding. <laughs> no, that's that's very true, and especially from from a third party standpoint, there's there's a lot of third parties I've talked to that they didn't understand why a, a shipment was late in the middle of the polar vortex, um, and it's it's very difficult from the carrier side to to not look at those guys and say you're being serious, right? Like you're not kidding. That's not a joke. Like you really don't understand why it's, why it's, it's not always on time in a winter like that. In fact, if anything, I think that, um, I think the, for the most part, a lot of the performance that happened during the polar vortex, the guys that did well, it, it really showed what sort of exceptional service providers they could be. But a lot of them, they just didn't, they just didn't have the resources to be able to overcome something like that because nobody anticipated a winter that bad. That said, there's there's a, a an example that I use all the time. It's in fact it's my favorite example for relation to this. But the one of the companies that that Carrier Direct uh, has a, a strong relationship with, Shift Freight, is based in California. It's a, an asset light carrier, and so they they contract with truckload carriers to take their take the freight off of their dock and and take it to a delivering terminal. Um, and this particular load was moving up towards the the northeast. Um, and in, on the 9094 interchange in Chicago, at one point in time, the driver called Shift and just said, "I'm I'm sorry, I'm just I'm really not comfortable driving in these conditions anymore. Um, I'm I'm not okay with where we are seeing things in terms of uh, weather, what what we're seeing in terms of conditions and what the the road is like. And it's it just there's so many cars. I'm just I'm really not comfortable. So, understandably so, and really respectfully so, uh, rather than pushing the driver and making him, you know, power through a situation he was uncomfortable with. They they said, okay, pull over. We will hire some some new guys to come and pick up the, the trailer uh, with a, a tractor, and, and we will find someone that is more well-equipped for this sort of weather. And so they hired from Michigan. They they deadheaded into, uh, into Illinois uh, some ice road truckers, a team of ice road truckers with, uh, you know, spikes and so forth and so on on their tractor and what other – whatever other you know weather equipment they needed and they finished driving to the northeast with the team and it was extraordinarily expensive for them to do it and it was just because they had a dedication to service and what was mind-blowing is when you hear some of the customer service calls from the brokers because the freight ended up ultimately being a day late but the, the some of these brokers would call and say well where's my freight it's like you really don't understand what we just had to go through to even have it be a day late as opposed to five so it, I couldn't stress enough how important it is to build a powerful culture and just be very cognizant of the challenges that lay in front of your partners, whether you're on the carrier side or on the 3PL side. Next, the one of the most challenging and, and albeit misunderstood factors that's involved is carrier education. Uh, I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had with brokers that have told me, well, I, I turned off Roadrunner and I turned off Central Transport because I just, I couldn't handle their service. And you, you kind of have to look at those guys and wonder what what part of those expectations of your own did you not manage? N not to say that we all know that Central Transport service is not the best in the industry. It's, it's understood. But more importantly, think about how much you paid to have that pallet move however many thousands of miles and the service that came with it. You should have expected that. Had you not needed service like that or if you needed that pallet to be delivered uh, on this particular day or a factory would shut down, then you pay for the service that would be associated with that price. Um, and, and so that's to say that there is, I, I very much believe, Joe, that there's a place in every single broker portfolio for an economy solution, for a standard solution and for premium solutions. When when a 3PL comes back and says, well, this Conway Freight, I can't use them. They're too expensive. Well, duh, it's Conway Freight. They are expensive. And similarly, when someone comes back and says, well, Central Transport Service is just bad. It's, you know, I don't understand it. You want Conway Freight Service, but at Central Transport rates. 
And again, what that highlights is understanding what the carrier provides and where their value is. It doesn't make sense to put a pallet of you know, raw materials that will not shut down a factory and are very unlikely to be damaged on a Conway freight as opposed to a central transport right. because it, it, at that point in time, the transportation likely costs more than the materials themselves. It is interesting, um, Eric, because I think the market in, in, in restaurants, we recognize a, there's McDonald's and Burger King and, and that that fast food, and sometimes that hits the spot, but it's not where you take your wife on your anniversary, right? <laughs> it's... um. You know, there's there's a place for all of them, and it's understanding again what 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 their what their unique value proposition is, whether it's price or service or somewhere in between. Exactly, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Joe. And more importantly, I also think really just understanding not only that that value proposition, but understanding the the implications of the decisions uh, and, and really managing your own expectations. Um, you know, when, when you when you ship on central transport, you should expect the, the freight to be delayed. Uh, but the bottom line is, again, you didn't pay very much for it. In fact, I think if there's any carrier that has been able to manage expectations and, and really develop their own product extremely well, it is central transport because they know exactly where they fit in the marketplace and they don't deviate from that. And because of that, they're likely one of the more profitable carriers in the marketplace. Um, the last thing to, to touch on is, is respect to carrier's risk. Uh, carriers holding the assets hold really at that point much more risk than 3PLs do. 3PLs can scale, and that's not to say that there's not investment that goes into managing a third party. I know some carrier, I'm sorry, some third parties that have invested on an annual basis hundreds of thousands of dollars into technology and maintaining it, if not more. Um, in fact, the best 3PLs have technology that is very heavily invested into. They have sales forces that are very heavily invested into and very trained. Um, but that said, it's different to train a sales force than it is to service a loan. It is different to uh, you know, buy a desk and a computer and a phone than it is to recruit drivers. Uh, so just respecting the risk that carriers hold in the market is is ultimately one of the, the biggest game changers because it's it's the most implied. When you're in a conversation with a carrier and you're you're trying to negotiate a a partnership or a contract, just understanding the risk that they have, I can almost guarantee you, even if it's not verbalized, will be will be a game changer in the way that that conversation is is interpreted by the carrier and is interpreted by the 3PL. Things will go much more smoothly when a 3PL just sort of steps back and says, okay, well, I, I really, I guess I do understand what you have to go through. I do understand the risk that you have, that when you cut a trailer, you're there to make service time. And I only have one shipment riding on that, but maybe half of your trailer is empty, but I still expect you to deliver my freight on time. And so again, just, just having that understanding and that respect for what carriers have to go through in order to be able to provide the service people expect of them is, is essential to developing and managing strong carrier relationships. Eric, we had a few questions related to this. Um, first off, what is the impact of all this on shippers? Um, we, we talked, you touched on a little bit, but also um, um, when when selecting a 3PL, are these these five things things you should consider, and what else besides those five things? When, when selecting a 3PL, it's really important to to recognize the amount of time and effort that's that's put into understanding the problems that might be at hand and developing or devising a, a solution that can be better. That's not to say that by virtue of being a transactional account for a transactional broker that there's going to be weeks or months on end of understanding your your supply chain and your needs. But sometimes it's even just when there's a reclass, really working to find a, an NMFC that better describes your freight. That That's even an indication of somebody that really cares. Or even before there's a reclass, more so is investing the time on the front end to figuring out what the right class for your freight is. Because even though even if your your class goes up and you might pay a little bit extra, you will save a substantial amount of time and money by being proactive about it. And so those are things, those are 
just traits that's very important for these shippers to understand. And that's how that they know brokers understand these five things when when they invest the time into understanding what freight they're giving their partners and when they, they have technology that supports their partners well. Um, those are the most important things to, to recognize. And that's not to say, too, that, that shippers shouldn't adhere to these as well because, again, shippers are – our customers and and just as much as a, a whoever is buying that shipper's freight, um, it wouldn't get there without the carrier, without that vendor. And so it, to say that these are important again is is a bit of an understatement. But in terms of how a, a shipper can evaluate a 3PL, understanding just the the culture, understanding how educated they are about the different options of carriers and and really helping to educate the shipper because that's not their core competency is is very important. And that's how you know you found a winner. That sounds good. Any other questions for Eric? Again, we're both available offline if there's other discussion. I know there's some things that uh, we've agreed we need to talk to offline. So, Eric, do you have anything uh, else in closing? Why don't you go to your uh, contact page? Sure. There we go. Uh, this is just the, the closing yeah. page. I, I do want to say, go ahead. Joe, thank you so much for uh, for being the cornerstone of, of putting this together and being the the motivating momentum behind this entire <laughs> webinar. Uh, oh, well, yeah, thank, we appreciate thank you. the opportunity to be associated with Logistics to Logistics. You guys have a you're very respectable Hollingsworth. brand there. <laughs> And, and Hollingsworth. And Hollingsworth. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you again. Without the uh, without this wonderful content, it wouldn't, wouldn't be worth it. So I appreciate I appreciate what you shared. This is wonderful insights, uh, game changing. Um, so you see Eric's information there, uh, his phone number, his uh, email. Uh, I know there's a lot of people, so be respectful of uh, all the phone calls. I think he'd rather get emails, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure he'll take your call though. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, participating and uh, uh, look forward to hearing your feedback. So please email your feedback or send it in the chat feature. Eric, you have any uh, closing remarks? No, I, I think you you covered everything. And just you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity again to to present. And yeah, if you, anybody has any other questions, I'm more than yeah, happy to discuss it. things. You nailed it, Eric. Thank you so much. Lunch. You really did nail thank it. You, this is really good. Thank you. Okay, uh, with that, we're going to close up uh, this webinar, and thank you, everybody, so much, and uh, we'll handle some of these things offline, these, some of these other emails, but again, thank you, everyone, for participating. It was wonderful. Thanks again, Eric. Thanks. Take care.